Welcome back to Fascinating History, where today we'll be discussing the era of the American frontier. The notion of the wild, unexplored frontier is important to the American psyche. This is not meant to indicate that the frontier does not exist. Rather, it has a special relevance in characterizing America in ways that go beyond the events that have occurred in its past. Although the 18th century is the first one that springs to mind, the notion of a frontier can be traced all the way back to when the first European immigrants encountered one on the east coast of the United States. At the beginning of that era, many Native American civilizations held sway over the majority of the region and dominated it. And by the period it was through, the West had matured into a flourishing community that welcomed new immigrants of various backgrounds. So what did the era of the American frontier look like? And what are the names that stand out during that period? Here, beneath the vast story of American history, we dive into an intricate saga that transcends time and space, illuminating the legends of the American frontier. Daniel Boone Daniel Boone is one of the most famous people from that era. He was a legendary frontiersman who was made into an immortal figure through time by means of movies and literature. During the American Revolution, he contributed to the opening up of the American frontier when he discovered the Cumberland routes that led to Kentucky. He was responsible for paving the Wilderness Road and other significant western roads. And, all the while, he was engaging in some very outrageous antics, one of which is lifted verbatim from the screenplay for the movie Taken. A year after Boone established the town of Boonesboro in 1776, the United States was in the middle of the Revolutionary War. And in July of the same year, Boone's daughter, Jemima, who was only 14 years old, was taken captive along with two other girls, Betsy and Fanny Calloway. The British sent a band of Shawnee warriors to Kentucky to harass and attack the American settlers who had settled there. The young women were held captive in a Shawnee settlement near Preston, near Chillicothe, Ohio. When Boone discovered this, he was, to put it nicely, not pleased. He organized a group of men to search for the individuals who kidnapped them. On the third day that his daughter was kept captive, Boone and his men stormed into the hamlet where the girls were being held and were able to rescue them. While rescuing the girls, Boone and his men killed several kidnappers while the rest ran away. The fact that Boone was able to find his daughter's kidnappers and set her free is another one of his accomplishments and a demonstration of his wilderness skills. In 1778, after a few more formative years had passed, Daniel Boone had yet another pivotal moment in his life. During the American Revolution, several Native American tribes and the British worked together to plan and carry out a series of attacks against American frontier settlements. One of these was an assault that took place in Boonesboro. In September of 1778, a large Shawnee warrior force headed by Chief Blackfish and assisted by British authorities was able to encircle and seize control of Boonesboro. Although they were outgunned and outnumbered, the Boonesboro settlers staved off the assault, at least for a little while. However, despite their best efforts, the settlers did not successfully maintain their food and ammunition supplies for long. The situation became even more precarious when a significant number of the slave fighters who had been fighting alongside the settlers fled to the Shawnee and carried with them a significant quantity of ammunition that was required. The Shawnee eventually cornered the colonists and forced them to negotiate a capitulation with them. After they were taken, Boone and several other settlers were held captive for a while. During his time spent with the Shawnee, Daniel Boone was given respectful treatment by the people of the tribe, and because he was regarded as the son of Chief Blackfish, he was even welcomed into the group. Sheltoe, which translates to Big Turtle, was ultimately bestowed to Boone as his given name, and he was granted permission to participate in the tribe's hunting and fishing activities. By studying the Shawnee people's language and customs, he gained a great grasp of their culture and became fluent in it. However, Boone was not permitted to come and leave whenever he pleased. 
He was still being held captive by the Shawnee, and they maintained a close watch on him. Boone was profoundly impacted by his time spent with the Shawnee people, and as a result, he wrote about his time there in his memoirs. He complimented the Shawnee for being courageous and kind and for their skills as hunters and warriors, although they beat him with a bundle of sticks and wouldn't let him go for a while. Davy Crockett What happens when a rugged and grizzled frontiersman is elected as a U.S. representative but subsequently feels frustrated with the inane bureaucracy? Well, he gives up, tells everyone, screw it, and moves to Texas. This is a story told about Davy Crockett. There was a lot more to him than what you presumably see today. He was a hunter who also worked as a wilderness guide with pistol in hand. Crockett was born in what is now eastern Tennessee on August 17, 1786. At his birth, eastern Tennessee was a part of North Carolina and because his parents were farmers striving to make a living, he spent most of his childhood having to fend for himself. At 18, Crockett began working as a cattle driver, guiding herds of animals through the woods to reach markets in Virginia and Georgia. And soon after arriving in Hunter, he made a name for himself as a skilled frontiersman, and he became famous for his quick shooting ability and his ability to survive in the woods. It is essential to remember that throughout this period, Crockett was building a name for himself that would eventually result in his election to the House of Representatives in the United States of America. Crockett had catapulted into the country's spotlight thanks largely to the attention garnered by the play The Line of the West. Even though the play's protagonist was not given the name Davy Crockett, he was very similar to the notorious bandit. The play, which was performed for the first time in 1831, was a satirical comedy that made fun of frontier life and politics. The play's main character was named Crockett. In the play, Crockett is portrayed as a larger-than-life figure full of bluster and braggadocio who has a kind heart despite this. Crockett's status as a national hero was cemented due to the widespread receptivity of viewers across the country to the character's quaint allure and down-home sense of humor. The play was historically significant since it occurred around the same era when Andrew Jackson rose to political power. In the beginning, Andrew Jackson was a strong admirer of Crockett. Jackson was seen as a reflection of the stalwart individuality and self-reliance that the Jacksonian Democrats prized. Crockett was a rising star, but throughout his time serving as a United States representative from 1824 until 1835, he witnessed firsthand how corrupt and dishonest politics could be. The political structure in Washington grew less and less appealing to Davy Crockett the longer he stayed there. He was a member of the Whig Party. Despite the fact that he regularly disagreed with the beliefs held by the party's leaders and members, one of the most significant problems that Crockett had was what he saw to be wasteful spending on the part of the government. He believed that the federal government was becoming excessively powerful and was, as a result, wasting public funds on initiatives that served no useful purpose. In spite of the fact that initially they were relatively close friends and allies, he acquired a particular disdain for President Jackson when he discovered how wicked Jackson truly was and how he prioritized the interest of his political followers over the nation's welfare. This led to their falling out of favor with one another. The Indian Removal Act of 1830 was one of the final straws that ultimately led to Crockett's decision to resign from Congress and relocate to Texas. But that is not all that was in the American frontier. In the early years of the westward expansion, some brazen robberies would likely make a modern thief cringe uncomfortably at the sheer ballsiness of the efforts. Who were these people who shocked their era and curved the narrative of the American Wild West? Jesse James Jesse James, who was only a child when he started out to join Confederate guerrillas in 1864, never really stopped fighting in the Civil War. Because Jesse could not accept that the secessionist movement had been unsuccessful, he took his frustration out on other institutions, including banks, railways, and stagecoaches. 
He fancied himself to be a modern-day version of the legendary outlaw Robin Hood, robbing money from radical Republicans and giving it to those who were less fortunate. However, the grimmer truth of the serial murderer, who continued to murder people long after the cause he supported had been abandoned, was hidden by the story. The myth served to disguise this reality. In the spring of 1864, the lanky teenager of 16 years old joined Bloody Bill Anderson's Lethal Rebel outfit. They used fear tactics against their opponents in rural Missouri, many of whom were Union supporters. Jesse, who was still a young and impressionable child, committed several crimes, including the infamous Centralia Massacre, which resulted in the deaths of 100 Union troops and the butchering of 22 helpless Union soldiers. Following the conclusion of the war, the majority of the guerrilla fighters, if not all of them, returned to regular life, putting their weapons away and picking up their plows instead. Frank James and Jesse, on the other hand, felt something was missing. They were still reeling from the shame of the Confederate defeat, and Jesse felt like a victim since the radical Republicans had denied the majority of former Confederates the right to vote. He decided to press on with the conflict and went after a bank in Gallatin, Missouri, which local rumors claimed was run by the guy responsible for Bill Anderson's death. On December 7, 1869, during the day, Jesse and Frank drove into the establishment, shot an unarmed cashier, and rushed out of the building with worthless notes. They pulled off an audacious escape while being followed by a posse sent after them. Jesse and his gang succeeded in getting away with robbing banks, stagecoaches, and railroads into the 1870s. They narrowly evaded being captured on many occasions while guarded by Confederacy loyalists. It is possible that Jesse came to believe that he was invincible due to his attempt to commit a bank robbery in Northfield, Minnesota in September 1876, more than 500 miles distant from his typical base of operations. The theft attempt was a complete failure. The town citizens had no patience for the former rebels, and they promptly put two of the robbers to death before setting out to find the others. Only Jesse and Frank successfully escaped, but were forced to live under false identities in Tennessee when they arrived. While Jesse could not settle down with his wife Z and son Jesse, Frank began to enjoy the quiet life. Jesse was restless and unable to settle down. He invested in racing horses and explored various other avenues leading to financial success. But nothing satiated his appetite for attention and admiration. Jesse returned to his criminal activities in 1879. However, by then, former Confederates had taken control of the political system in Missouri, and the people of the state had become dissatisfied with his banditry. One of Jesse's new gang members, who were not former soldiers but were just in it for the money, coordinated with the governor of Missouri to track down the outlaw and earn a $10,000 prize. On April 3, 1882, Jesse was killed by a bullet to the back of the skull. The legend around him eventually became so powerful that it overshadowed the unflattering realities of his murderous life. Butch Cassidy on April 13, 1866, in the town of Beaver, Utah, a man named Maximilian Parker fathered a son named Robert Parker, later known as Butch Cassidy, who would become one of the most notorious con artists in the history of the American West. Parker, who was the eldest of 13 children living in a poor household, in which the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints was practiced, ran away from home when he was a teenager in the hopes of finding a better and more profitable life than his parents had been able to provide for him. After working for several different ranches, he eventually became acquainted with Mike Cassidy, a rancher with a reputation for committing thefts involving horses and other livestock. The younger Parker looked up to the elder Cassidy even beginning to emulate him and show respect for his family, eventually taking on the name Butch Cassidy. It is believed that Cassidy was a charming thief who made many friends and was not responsible for the deaths of any other individuals during his career. 
His first encounter with a huge robbery came in June 1889, when he and three other cowboys took more than $20,000 from the San Miguel Valley Bank in Telluride, Colorado. Cassidy purchased his own ranch close to Du Bois, Wyoming in 1890 and continued his horse wrestling and cattle career there. In 1894, he was taken into custody for his crimes, and for his punishment, he received a jail term of two years. Cassidy immediately resumed his life of crime after being freed from prison in 1896. Cassidy started what is considered to be the longest run of successful train and bank robberies in American history with several other well-known outlaws including Harry Longabaugh, also known as the Sundance Kid, William Ellsworth Lay, LZ Lay, Ben Kilpatrick, the Tall Texan, and Harvey Logan, Kid Curry, all of whom were members of a group known as the Wild Bunch. In August 1896, the gang's initial mission was to steal from banks and railroads in South Dakota, New Mexico, Nevada, and Wyoming. They succeeded in their first attempt, taking over seven grand from one of the banks. Between their many acts of criminality, the individuals concealed themselves in Johnson County, Wyoming's Hole in the Wall Pass, which was known to be a safe haven for several bandit bands. With each succeeding theft, the bunch earned a reputation and recognition among the American public, and the amount that they stole also rose with time. One of the most valuable hauls, worth $70,000, came from a railroad just outside of Folsom, New Mexico. Since the Union Pacific Railroad was powerless to stop the bunch, they went so far as to pardon Cassidy in exchange for his promise to stop robbing people and accept a position as an express guard for the organization. Cassidy accepted the offer, but the bunch continued to commit crimes. Union Pacific resorted to calling the authorities to end the Wild Bunch when everything else failed. According to the urban tale, the two criminals were determined to plunder banks and railways in South America. The classic account states that Cassidy and the Sundance Kid were killed in a gun battle with Bolivian forces on November 6, 1908. However, several pieces of historical evidence suggest that Cassidy fabricated his own death to travel to the United States under the name of William T. Phillips. The facts contained in Phillips' book, Bandit Invincible, the story of Butch Cassidy, which he published in 1920, helped spread the story. The book contains details that maybe only Butch Cassidy himself would have known. Dalton Gang Lawmen and outlaws Emmett Dalton, Frank Dalton, Grattan Grat Dalton, Robert Rennick, Bob Dalton, and Mason Frakes, William, Bill, Dalton, grew up in a family of 15 in Kansas, close to Indian Territory. Between 1884 and 1887, Frank Dalton served as a deputy United States Marshal at Fort Smith, Arkansas, for the Federal District Court of Western Arkansas. He was killed on November 27, 1887. He was a decent officer who did his job well, and as a result, he acquired the respect of his colleagues. After moving out from Oklahoma, Grat, Bob, and Emmett joined their older brothers, who had already established themselves in California and were finding employment there. In February of 1891, criminal charges were brought against Bill, Grat, Bob, and Emmett for allegedly stealing a Southern Pacific train at Alila, California. Both Bill and Grat were arrested and taken into detention. The beginning of Bob and Emmett's return to Oklahoma marked the beginning of the Dalton Gang. During Grat's trial, he was found guilty. Although over a dozen witnesses had positively identified him as being in a hotel in Fresno at the time of the robbery, Bill was also put on trial but was declared not guilty. In September of 1891, Grant managed to escape from prison, and after that, he traveled to Oklahoma to spend time with his brothers there. 
During this time, Bob and Emmett recruited a crew of accomplices that included Bill Powers, Charlie Pierce, Dick Broadwell, William McElhaney, and Bill Doolin. And they began stealing from trains in Oklahoma. On May 9, 1891, a robbery occurred at the Santa Fe in Wharton. On September 15, 1891, a robbery occurred at the Katy in Missouri, Kansas, and Texas. On June 1, 1892, a robbery occurred at the Santa Fe in Red Rock. And on July 14, 1892, a robbery occurred at the Katy in Adair. On October 5, 1892, Bill Powers, Dick Broadwell, Bob, Grant, and Emmett Dalton made an attempt to rob two banks in the same location at the same time in Coffeyville, Kansas. Emmett was left with life-threatening injuries while four other gang members were gunned down and killed. After the events of the Coffeyville raid, it is believed that Bill Dalton joined forces with the Doolin gang. He took part in the gunfight on September 1, 1893, in Ingalls, Oklahoma Territory, in which the Doolin gang was responsible for the deaths of three deputy United States Marshals. So, what are your thoughts on the American frontier lifestyle? And what do you think about the lives of the American frontier bandits? Please let us know your responses in the comment section below. And don't forget to like and share. Also, hit the subscribe button to find notifications on the latest uploads on the channel. And, as always, see you in the next video.